<laughs> All right. Um, so what we're doing here, folks, is a follow-up to the transpersonal uh, community-wide discussion panel that we had, uh, really talking about the role of transpersonal work when the, uh, the person engaging in that work is really there because they're experiencing psychological mental health related suffering. Um, you know, uh, does transpersonal uh, work support that? Does it complicate that? Um, and so this is a follow up to that, uh, that roughly two hour uh, panel discussion that we had. Um, so we're gonna go through and answer some questions, but uh, Eric, why don't you start us off? Well, I'm wondering if, if there's time, if there's interest to give a more full, uh, maybe an example of what a tier two mm -hmm. healing would look like mm -hmm. and how tier one is, uh, you know, how tier one informs that or supports that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we talked about what it means to do tier two tier two work and the dismantling of identity and those kinds of things. But a more clear example, I think, might be really interesting. Um, mm. I'll just throw that out there if if there's time, if, if there's interest. Yeah. Um, OK, OK, great. Um, so why we could begin with that if uh, anybody wants to sort of speak to that or we could jump into the very more uh, specific questions from the actual webinar. Um, does anybody want to want to start in with that or do you have something to say about it, Eric? Um, I don't I don't want to start. With that on. <laughs> I'm just I'm really curious to, about others thoughts of. It, you know, what what would be someone be experiencing if they were going through a deep tier two healing? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just speak to it to the so first of all, let me say that, you know, um, I think it would be great to get a lot more seat time uh, with what we're talking about here, you know, what we're this model that we've come up with the, the three tiers. It's, it's not based on um, research or anything. It's based on sort of anecdotal observation of what we see. I think, uh, you know, certainly in my own process and what, what I typically tend to see in other people's process. Um, so, so having said that, you know, it would be great if we just had a lot more experience going into uh, the realms of tier two with people. Uh, as it is right now, um, you know, there's, there's aspects of about it that I typically recommend that our students not go into uh, purposefully because, um, you know, it's it's definitely more of an advanced level of of deconstruction and reconstruction, and it requires a lot of holding. And uh, generally speaking, I think if people are new to this work, uh, they they want to you know as much as you can keep uh, staying with tier one processing before moving to tier two. Um, but in my experience of it, I'll just say, uh, what I, what I've seen of it is really, it's a, um, you know, it's, I would call it kind of a break from reality that's happening as part of the healing process. And it's a break from reality, but you're moving sort of into in out into and out of sort of a new reality, um, you know, and, so the, the uh, you know, an aid, uh, an example that I typically use with it is, you know, talking about that movie Shutter Island uh, that, that came out years and years ago. With, it's with Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's with a, it's, it's a very confusing, disorienting movie because it's filmed from the perspective of an unreliable narrator. You know, uh, you know, most of the time when you read a book or you see a movie, you know, there's like a stability of consciousness. You're seeing what's what's happening there. Um, and I think the way that this movie is filmed in per uh, on purpose is kind of what a tier two experience is like, which is to say that there's a flip flopping that's going on. You're moving into the reality of your childhood and the programming and the way that you experience yourself and the world uh, in that uh, uh, in that 
reality and that programming and then moving to something very different. And that's why it tends to be very uh, uh, disorienting, destabilizing, much more so, I think, than anything that happens in tier one. Um, can I jump it, in there? So? Yeah, yeah, please. Because I think there are times where doing deep tier one work triggers exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking this question. Yeah. That's why we're inviting this topic. So yeah. yeah, I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. I could imagine, especially if you're working around disrupting really deeply dug in roles around perpetrator, victim, rescuer, caregiver, right? Once those start to get loosened and people start to, you know, get a little bit of a handle on how their trauma histories or their attachment trauma histories have shaped those patterns in them. I imagine that the disorientation that comes with that could be quite destabilizing, right? Because it's like, like, who am I if I'm not functioning in this way that I've always known myself and my identity has always been propped up by these certain um, very comprehensive kind of role constraints. And then who am I if I don't have those? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of vulnerability um, can be destabilizing, but yeah. important and, and constructive and creative ultimately, but a little terrifying in the process. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question that I'm wondering might help explain this, um, maybe not, is if we use the IFS, model as a way to describe tier two i wonder if that is helpful like a, a deep deep maybe exile that's in like the deep crevices ref, like of our psyche like hidden away so far and that this work through um can help kind of bring that exile forward and then it becomes almost like a psychotic break where it's like I don't know who I am. You're interfacing with an exile part that you never even thought existed. That's an aspect of you. I would imagine, I'm just, that, that's my question is, could we articulate a little bit of tier two from that point of view or that lens of IFS? That, I think that's a really good question. And it's a question that I've had for some time. So first of all, let me say that I'm not IFS trained and I've had limited experience with it. Um, but my sense of tier two is that it's more profound than subpersonalities that where, you know, if there's like a, a, generally speaking, if there's a stable self that's doing all the dialoguing between parts, um, that's not tier two. Um, I think tier two is much more uh, foundational and much more, um, the deconstruction that happens seems much more profound than sort of, okay, here's something that it was holding like this memory and now it's coming back to me. Um, but but again, maybe I'm like not understanding the depth that, that IFS works at. So it's kind of my sense as well too. And like to what like Eric was touching on where there's like an overlap of what that destabilization or deconversation looks like for tier one and tier two processing. When I think about tier two, it's, it is more profound because it feels more global. Like mm -hmm. if we're thinking about like a set of memories or a cluster of memories that's being processed through a tier one, a tier one like channel. Um, and we're kind of comparing that to like a computer system. I, I think of that as like more of like a program that's kind of moving through a system versus things that have to do with tier two. We're dealing with the OS system, right? The thing that, that holds all the tier one material. Mm -hmm. So when there is that decompensation or destabilization that happens, it's the fabric of the reality and it's, it's more global as in like, yeah, it's a piece of one's identity that applies to all situations, at least the way I've mm -hmm. personally experienced my like tier two processes. No, that's really nicely said, Daniel. It's not situation specific. It's, it's like the identity that deals with all situations. Kind yeah. Of, right? yeah. It's, it's firing off in every moment, right? Yeah. In the background versus tier one, there's a certain situation that could awake that material, certain types of relationships, certain moments in a relationship versus just relationships in general always has this background like process that's taking place. Mm -hmm. 
And I think so. I then think... I would. No, please go ahead. So then I'm kind of just thinking of my own personal experience. So it's like under that definition, then I would say that I've had a couple of pretty significant, what you might call like psychotic breaks, where it's like this break from reality using this model and thought they were tier two, but under that definition, they were tier one. So that's, so that's why I'm like wondering, like, yeah. So maybe you can have some level of break from reality in at a tier one level and a tier two level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And, and I would also say that um, if we are using the analogy of IFS, you don't like you you don't really have to have uh, like a stable sense of self. Like like if I like that that's the goal, but um, from an IFS point of view, if you've got an XL part that's like really split off. And that comes back into the mix um, and you're seeing through that lens, it's extremely, extremely, extremely destabilizing. You can't, it, your, your sense of core self or a stable self is gone. You can't, right? You're back, you're in Shutter Island. Mm -hmm. So if, so I've had that experience. So I'm wondering if even the Shutter Island um, experience is a tier, can be a tier one uh, experience and a tier two. So this is where I'm getting confused. Yeah. I think it's a blend. I, I, I think part of the, the tier two destabilization is linked to the, to the nervous system. Like it's, it's, it, it's, I agree that it's a global identity and how it sees the world, but it's a real deeply felt sense as well of, of destabilization. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you, if you would be willing to say more about your how your experience was more tier one. Does that mean that you didn't have a sense of identity that was part of your that was in at play with your destabilization? Or you know? I did. Um, we can use my example and unpack it and, and do some psycho ed to see which where it goes. But um, I had. So a very strong, um, if we want to call it like rage part that had like like murderous, murderous kind of rage, kind of we've talked, we've unpacked this very like a perpetration kind of energy to it um, as a counterattack to some of the trauma that I encountered. And it was ex buried away extremely, extremely, extremely deep and, and like really far away. It has cut, split right off. And when it started to uh, come into play, I I couldn't tell reality. I couldn't tell what was real from not real. Um, I was getting like just a lot of perpetration thoughts. Um, I was seeing the world from a lens I'd never experienced or encountered before, um, you know. And then ha then the overlay was, I think I might be, there's might be something wrong with me in terms of mental illness. Maybe I have, in blah 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 and I could not I, I couldn't tell what was real from not real and I had to have other people almost like like um reality check help me reality check because I I couldn't I think I was reached out to Sage there was a lot of a lot of destabilization that was shocking me and um destabilizing me so is that tier one tier two all I know is is now working with that that um split off piece it's now become an aspect of my core self um it's integrated into who i am and, and my sense of being and and i can feel like it and it actually literally it's almost like i can feel a shift when it comes in um and it's really just helped me anchor myself in many many ways in a different in a different orientation i do see the world now from a different way and I feel from a different way. Um, yeah, Jai, so it's integrated I, in. Too. I would say what you just described there and kind of basing it on your description, but also knowing it a little bit more from our, our interactions, um, I would say that's tier one. Okay. Yeah, it's, 
like that's what I mean. I think I think that's the realm that you know we're talking about with IFS. That oh, here's these sub personalities, exiles, you know, th- parts of self that were holding traumatic reality that were not available to us, and that's coming back to us. I think that's different than you know the very fabric of self and reality um, tearing apart, um, mm-hmm. and. And I wonder if we're, you know, using, a, being a little bit more specific here, but like, um, you know, that that question of what's real, what's not real for y- your system may have been part of the original trauma in a way that, you know, tier two kind of work doesn't have to have that as part of the original trauma. And yet it's kind of, it's really destabilizing that way, right? So in other words, in, in your system, your your child self may have been, like really wondering what's real here, what's real here, because that, so that that was encoded as part of the traumatic memory versus, um, if that's making sense. Yeah. I, and maybe another way to to put this is, uh, you know, like t- tier one processes don't challenge personality disorder, right? And personality, I think we can all perhaps agree with this that you know personality disorder is not like some split off part of self that's uh that needs to you know come back and be integrated and then you no longer have a personality disorder right personality disorder is the very kernel of self has been uh touched by the by the uh developmental traumatic experiences i wonder if a good Mm -hmm. metaphor is to think of tier one work if you're thinking of a tree right that tier one work involves a branch or a branch here but tier two work involves like the root system and the trunk. So you can be out on a branch and it can be a very, very compelling and intense and even destabilizing branch that you're doing work on. And your whole reality could feel like it's that branch, you know, while you're out on it, while you're out on that limb. And then, you know, doing that work, you kind of, it gets integrated as part of the whole. But if you're working at the level of the roots, like nothing is untouched by that. Like that's pervasive. So it's it's like it's at this kind of deeper, more global, you know, leave nothing untouched level. And I think the tricky thing that maybe all of us are struggling with is that there are pieces of tier one that can feel very destabilizing and that can feel very global. Like when you're in them, that's all that exists. That's your whole reality. And only afterwards do you realize, oh, that was just a part, or that was just one aspect of my whole being. It felt like the whole being when I was in it, you know, but I think it is, it's a slippery concept, this tier two. And that's why my mind went to metaphor. Like, how can we grasp this at, you know, at a more conceptual level and this idea of like roots, that tier two is more roots work. Um, that's a great I, think, I think that's what Daniel was saying. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Cause like when you're saying that, if, you know, when we're in a pressurized container, we're processing specific material let's say even if it's a split, it could be like we're in a very specific room. And while we're in the room, it's filling up the whole room and it's global. Versus like tier two, it's like, you're realizing the room is the whole house, right? And it's affecting every single aspect of the living, of the living space. I love that. And I think we're actually answering one of the other questions on, you know, about parts work and- (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh Right, because we're, we're talking about the relationship of the parts to the whole and how complex that can get. And I love that metaphor. I used to talk about dissociative disorders, the compartmentalization piece of dissociation as different rooms of the house and getting stuck in a room and not realizing realizing that there are other rooms and have you know, part of kind of integration is having effective passageways and ways of kind of getting from one room to another and remembering that there are other rooms and choosing the room that you, you know, you you're most suited to be in at any given moment. And so I, I really like the metaphor of the house for different parts of the self and, and the whole. Mm-hmm. So then would you say something like DID, dissociative identity disorder is still tier one because you're just accessing all of these exiles and like beginning to actually build an orientation of the house and all the different rooms in the house. That's a tough one because yeah. DID is so pervasive in someone's life and 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 I don't know that one's a that's a tricky one I'd have to think about that because I almost feel like this this exile or this split off is was literally almost like a DID part like it was very verging borderline on that so that's why you know maybe we're getting into the 
like an intellectual qu question that maybe is not really, I don't know how no, important well, it is to go into. No, I think this is great, but I think we pro this is probably where we need more data points and like find ways to really, you know, explore it in a, in a more research fashion, you know, more rigorous fashion. I will give you one data point though that I had from doing a piece of ketamine session with one of my long-term DID patients. And at the end of, actually this was the second ketamine session that we did. And she did, first one she was very, you know, a very beautiful and kind of integrative experience. The second one was a little bumpier and she worked through a piece of integrating some split off parts that were interrupting the process. And at the end, she had this very beautiful, spontaneous metaphor of she felt like all parts of her were algae moving underwater and they were moving in sync with each other. <laughs> and she said she had never felt that kind of sense of resonance across her whole system, that they were all seaweed moving with the currents of the water. And I just thought that was such a beautiful metaphor for the, the in syncness that can come you know, and kind of this natural spontaneous integration that can come on the other piece of doing, you know, a piece of, of deep medicine work, uh, even, even for someone with DID. And this is someone who's very late in her treatment process, has a ton of internal communication, almost no lost time anymore. So she's like very highly recovered DID, not, not early or, you know, she's very stable and has lots of life supports and lots of resources and it would not have done a... <laughs> a piece of ketamine session with someone in an early kind of stage of DID mm. recovery. Um, but I think it's important as a data point to say this, this really can help people with um, fragmented inner systems, fragmented uh, internal systems. And this was a polyfragmented individual, like hundreds and hundreds of part, not like I have six parts of the self that I need to, you know, this was like lots of seaweed was <laughs> a field of seaweed was moving together. Um, but it makes me hopeful that, you know, that there's a, a place for, for this kind of work, um, even with severe dissociative disorders. I don't really like that word because I think dissociation is such a not disordered thing that our brain does, <laughs> even in the extreme um, cases. So I wish we could banish the word disorder from our diagnostic <laughs> nomenclature. I feel like we could have a whole webinar just on that, <laughs> just on that piece, the, um, the fragmentation, you know, subpersonalities, uh, DID as, as dissociation. And maybe we should. I, I have a little piece. Oh, yeah. go ahead. If I could have one more piece around the IFS, um, like I think hypothetically, if someone is if someone is working through IFS and they were to move through a tier two process, I think with that vernacular, what it would look like is the the self with a capital S that the person identifies with, that starts to decompensate and realizing that that's an actually an XL. Right? I think that's that's kind of like what it would look like from a IFS perspective. Right, right in these parts that are X out, the thing that is global that is observing and connected uh, to all the pieces starts yeah. to break down and are realizing, oh, this is not what I thought it was. This is something completely different and it shapes their whole reality and everything that's connected to it. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, feeding off what Daniel just said. I'm, I'm curious, the, the I don't know the the transformational quality or the emergence of the transformation that we might see in an individual at a tier two. I know that you know their core self changes, the roots of the tree changes, and so does that mean you go from like a birch tree to a poplar tree? Like 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 how does you know what I'm saying? Like what like 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 that's what I'm trying to understand is what like how do how does a person come out of that in terms of like a changed identity and how does it present itself to the outside world? I mean, again, if I look at myself and I'm thinking about like one or two other clients is the transformation is so like extreme that it does feel like it's a whole, you're working, you're talking with a whole other individual, which if I look back on my history, I don't, I don't, I don't see a lot of res resemblance to my old self. Mm -hmm. 
I'm thinking of a couple of my other clients. So I'm kind of just curious the quality of, of the transformation that emerges out of a tier two compared to a tier one. And how do we how do we see it in others and in ourselves? Do we change from poplar to birch? <laughs> Hardwood to softwood? Like I don't know that I have an answer, but wow, what an awesome question. Yeah. <laughs> Love Great it. Question. I, I wonder if it's more of a uh, ongoing process that it's not, uh, you know, like a huge tier two, I'm a whole new identity, but, you know, through all these tier one transformational mm -hmm. processes, slowly a new tier two evolves or, you know, appears or, mm -hmm. yeah, develops whatever word works there. It's hard to think of it other than that, really. I like where you're taking it, Eric. I, I love that interpretation, right? You have all these tier one experiences and it over time creates a, a different tier two, like something new emerges transformationally. Yeah. Um, and then maybe that something new is kind of closer to this amorphous concept of like a tr like true self, like true, deep, authentic, original unwounded self you know like we're kind of healing and stripping away these layers of armoring and wounding and scabs and scars and right like whatever it is that has had to kind of package over and pack over the kind of inner inner light or inner true self I mean it starts to sound kind of spiritual but I think this is like maybe like either just me or like what we're heading into state or not state three into tier three like what what is what exactly are we aiming for here like we peeling away all the trauma all the defenses all the accommodations all the scarring all the thickening all the callousing and and then what do we have do we have like a flourishing tree do we have we're removing impediments we're like getting someone back to the original state that would be there if someone could magically live a life with no trauma and you know <laughs> good enough parenting and <laughs> We yeah, become a well, forest instead of a tree. Say that again, Eric. We're a forest of many different trees. Then, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Sash. No, okay. Well, I, I was just going to say that you know we see homeostatic self correction at so many other levels in the organism. Why wouldn't tier two also have a homeostatic self correction, like taking us to this sort of you know, like this very unique, uh, yet, you know, this thing that we, you were always meant to be. Mm -hmm. right. I like those words, always meant to be. Yeah. Coin that, always. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind, um, Eric, if you can just speak more to to what you just um, articulated around the, the tier two is uh, I, my interpretation like almost emerges out of this tier one reorganization that happens over time. I, I don't know if you like whatever you shared there, if you could like maybe elaborate, I'd like to hear more on how you're seeing this. Before you do that, I'm just going to sign off everybody. Oh, so okay. another I have to go. It's lovely, enriching and wonderful to be with you all. Happy, <laughs> happy birthday to your kiddo. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was a great question for, for us to, you know, start in on. Good, good, good call, Eric. Yeah. I don't know if I have a lot more to add to that, actually, Jaya. I mean, it, it, it's, it, this is just coming right now off, off the top of my head as we're discussing this. But this is so helpful for me to, to understand more deeply how to make sense of tier two um because i, I i've always thought of like I, it seems so intertwined with tier one and i think that's kind of where we're getting to here and the you know it, right in this moment i'm getting to this sense of all the tier one work is hopefully leading to a a different tier two identity experience that is something that we were always meant to be you know if you want to put it that way I like that um 
I don't, I, I, I can't, I, I can't um, imagine the tier two experience as a, you know, I, I go into a psychedelic experience and I come out and it, it, all of a sudden, I don't know, you know, it just makes more sense to me to think of it as a progression of a lot of tier one. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's not possible. Yeah. I think, I think it probably can show up in different ways. Maybe it can show up in a more titrated way, as you're describing, Eric, where, you know, you're doing tier one work and then you're having effects in tier two land. Um, I will say, I'll share a little bit of my story with this, which is that, um, you know, I think from my childhood, I had a, what I would call a narcissistic defense, right? And um, where, you know, obviously as an adult, I could sit here and interact with people and know that people exist. But I think from my core, core programming of having a lot of neglect, abandonment and trauma and very early developmentally, my system just made people go away. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I found on medicine experiences when I finally hit real empathy, when I finally hit that, oh my God, other people exist, you know, <laughs> which is like such an obvious thing at one level, but such a profound thing for a childhood co child consciousness to have. Um, yeah, that definitely threw me into not a titrated uh, tier two experience, but a very sort of big tier two experience involving depression, involving, I mean, all sorts of things where, you know, my system was dissociated around the, the fact that people exist. And now that they do, then, you know, solution was showing up in ways. And um, yeah, like just, this is kind of a bizarre thing to say, but the realization that other people existed how, how it looked, by the way, I'll just share this, which was uh, the, the process was like, I, I felt like I was in this one man tent and that was the entire universe. And I thought to myself, like, why is this, why is everybody like in awe of the universe when it's just a stupid one man tent and I'm the only person in here. And so the process was really, you know, the tent was the fabric of the tent was really ripping apart. And then there was an entire universe outside of the universe that my child mind had constructed. Um, so I don't know what you would call that. That's not, it didn't feel like another self or, or something like that. It felt like just like a very different version of reality showing up here. And the consequences of it were like perhaps the most significant depression that I've ever experienced in my life showed up simply because all you know i was no longer in dissociation around the existence of people and now that people were there it meant all these other things right so um and it was definitely shutter island it was back and forth in this kind of flip-flopping way and i felt that i had you know a lot of ground under my feet i had a lot of stability i'd been doing a lot of tier one work so there was not nearly as much trauma or dissociation in my system and uh, and even with that, you know, it was it was uh, it was a wild ride. And what was it that what was it a tier one process that brought that about, or was it it was a no? Another? I would say it was it it was a tier two process. Um, okay. It was you know a tier two medicine process in in Amsterdam that brought that about. It was psilocybin. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and then, are you willing to say a little bit more about how you? worked through that? Was it more tier two work or more tier one work? It was just holding on as my system was like, now that this revelation had been made and the dam had been broken, it was just kind of holding on because I didn't understand it. This was like the first time I didn't have a mental map for what was going on and what this flip-flopping was or, or anything like that. Uh, like uh, this was before even any kind of mapping of tier tiers was happening. Uh, for me and so I was just like okay I, I just have to keep holding on here mm -hmm. so, yeah how so long were you in that process sorry um, not a good question this was a couple of years ago I mean a num yeah a number of years ago probably 10 years ago so um I don't feel like I'd have a I don't think I have a like a great answer because I don't 
it, it was hard to tell when it precisely began and ended, but I think it was probably like, you know, again, like probably like a three month process. I remember it being the summertime and I would walk outside and the world would be you know, going back and forth in these very, very weird ways in my system. Yeah. Like you would switch on where like people existed and then you would default back to the previous, like no one exists. And yeah, things like that. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, like some, some very like basic facet of reality kept moving back and forth. And therefore like my entire, it's my, I wasn't on firm ground. With it. Yeah. But so you, you held on and essentially your system worked it through and then on the other side at the end you you were more in the new reality of people exist yeah yeah i would say all in the new reality and again we're talking about what i saw there was again a narcissistic defense you know where uh, oh okay there's so much wounding here you know this is personality level things that that are turning on and i was just imagining you know, somebody else with like much who, you know, has that to a much deeper degree, you know, imagine like, I don't know, like a Trump or somebody who has that to a much deeper degree and, and the amount of like personality challenge that that person would have to experience. But yeah, so I, I fortunately happily landed on the other side. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that. That's so helpful. Yeah. So it's really yeah. helping me uh, differentiate between your experience and, and Jaya's and Jai, how, how long was your experience, if you don't mind, of your destabilization? Yeah, I think um, I, maybe it, it went, there's like maybe three stages, although I don't know, even know if I'm still at the end. Um, but one would be just utter shock and disorientation. And just as I said, like basic facet of reality moved back and forth. Like I couldn't tell who I was. I was starting to become terrified of who I was. Um, like my whole reality was like, who am I? What is the outside world? I couldn't get a grasp on even the, my geographic location. Um, very, very, very destabilized. Um, mm. And um, and it, in some ways I can relate to the whole, like, like people, do they exist? Do they not exist? Like, what are they? But then it moved out of that. I think it took about a... Um, a month and it and then after that I I buried it again because I got so terrified of it um so I learned how to regulate it a little bit and like kind of like manage it or regulate it or um kind of resource around it and so that was like step two I needed to have some sort of agency around it because it scared the pants off me so badly um so so disorienting so destabilizing and so then once I saw that I could like play like peekaboo with it like okay there you are what are you about um and then like and then you know turn around and go function in my life that was like a huge breath of fresh air um so it was maybe for me like step two and then once I knew I could have some agency around like okay I'm not I'm I'm not going I'm not having a psychotic break uh, there's just this extreme like part that I've broken off from that I have to begin to kind of get to know. But when I open up the lid to it, it hijacks me and I literally don't, I have a sense of like, I can't, I can't tell what's real from not real. Um, and I started to track what triggered it the most, clearly talking to family mm -hmm. triggered it the most. I would, I'd all of a sudden not know my name. I wouldn't know who I was. I wouldn't know, like everything vanished, my sense of reality. So agency and was the second and then once I had that then the third stage was like working with it and exploring it and getting a sense on its personality and and integrating it and allowing it to become my core sense of it, an aspect of my core sense of self which is I think like that seems to be a very ongoing thing and um what I'm noticed now is when I do shove it back into the recesses of my psyche then I start having actual physical symptoms showing up I can sense like oh I'm I'm pretending like this part doesn't exist and um, then it shows up in physical ways it's like gut issues that sort of thing you know we talk about tier two work being more I can't know advanced or whatever it is but it doesn't sound like that to me it sounds like it doesn't sound like your experience is harder than Jaya's experience. It's always like, mm -hmm. 
those both sound very difficult to me. So I, I, I'm just throwing that out there because we have said that, you know, it's good to do the tier one work to get ready for the tier two work, but the tier one work, if we're agreeing that Jaya is yours is tier one and that sounds very difficult. That's a, that's a, that flip of, of what's real and, and so mm -hmm. on. Did you say how long that process was roughly for you, Jaya? I guess six months. Okay. I, I think what allowed it to come for, and I, okay, this is another follow up question. Like, if I look back now that I articulate it, what allowed, okay, if we do call it an exile, if we do say it's like a part, like a state, a tier one part, it sent solution. And so it, it was open to being, right? It sensed you guys as being like, so I think that sensed relational solution, enough relational solution on board, like, Oh, I can pick up the phone and and talk to you guys, and you guys would anchor me back into what's real, you know, blah 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 blah. That 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 opened up the process for me to kind of keep going. Otherwise, I think I probably would have destabilized and gone off into outer space and re dissociated again, and who knows what would have happened. So I guess my question is: Is solutioning? How does solution come on board if it's a tier one destabilization versus? a tier two, like I'm just curious if that's different. Well, I, I think something similar about them is that perhaps both of those processes won't open up without solution on board, you know? Um, okay. and, and I think, you know, as we talk about it in the training, like tier two opens up when enough tier one processing has happened and maybe there, it's just, you know, there's more solutions showing up, there's more intrapsychic solutions showing up. Uh, you know, in my example, it was like somehow rec this recognition that other people exist and I was in this one man tent universe. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think perhaps the, the similarity here is um, that to kick off these processes, there has to be a recognition of solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. and I think maybe, we should, uh, yeah, yeah. And not everybody watching this is going to know yeah. what we mean by solution. So maybe we, you we, could we, reference the um, uh, the solution video that we have on YouTube with uh, Charlie. <laughs> so, but with maybe just really quickly here, we'll say. I mean, maybe people are inferring, but you know that there are there's something to reach to for support relationally, mostly in this case. There's there's a sense of it's you know there's somebody else in my life that I can that knows me that I trust that's safe something like that for now is probably enough. Yeah. Can we? I, I'm happy to move on to another question, but I'm my brain is still like. <laughs> By the way, this this was not one of the questions that was asked. <laughs> this is. <was> a... <laughs> Now I'm wanting to explore from attachment style. Like I'm like now wanting to like wait a minute. Like, like yeah. Like so I don't know. I, I can back off or we can keep going. Are you you want to bring in attachment style to to tier two? Is I that what do, you do to this conversation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't have to. Okay. Uh, okay. That was rich. That was that was awesome. Everyone, thank you. Um, okay, even though <laughs> we're not answering. Okay, so maybe uh, uh, why don't we start with this one from Robin. Uh, does dissociation ever get completely cleared? Can one really not do any tier two work without this as a prerequisite? Um, I, I have a relatively succinct answer to this one, which is to say that no, I mean, there's no 100% requirements for moving into tier two. You don't have to be 100% trauma-free, 100% um, without dissociation. It's a good enough model um, where, you know, there's enough of you here. There's enough of you sort of present and able to engage and experience what's going on in your system. And then these processes tend to turn on. Um, and I don't know what that percentage is. I don't know if people have to do uh, what 60 or 70 or 80% uh, of their work. Um, but it's clearly not a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, Saj, you went into a tier two experience, the one you just told, yeah. and you hadn't 
uh, you know, you have more dissociation after that for sure. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Um, people's like interest in understanding the difference. Like I can sense it inside of me. The difference between um, tier one and tier two, and like, why are people so intrigued by this whole tier two, um, you know, identity shift that can happen? Like, what is it about us that's like compelled to understand it? Um, so I'm just kind of that question that. Robin asked is now having me question the whole <laughs> question. Is it because we're we're fascinated with transformation? Is it because we're scared of of we're both repelled by complete you know uh, destruction and recreation of our own sense of self? Like what is it about understanding this that is mesmerizing? Mm -hmm to us and others. Uh, I mean, I imagine there's a different reasons, but you know, there's also this conditioning, I think that many of us have to get somewhere and <laughs> up is often <laughs> the uh, goal. Mm -hmm. So once we're done with one, we can get to two, and then we. Can get three and then... I see. <laughs> two is a bigger number than one. <laughs> I want to stay to experience. Oh, too. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I can also see if, especially if people have been in therapy for fifteen years, right, twenty years, and they're just you know rehashing the same material, and they're just staying in either secondary consciousness, or maybe they're moving in primary, but they're just not accomplishing sort of fundamental shifts that they're looking for. I can see somebody be saying like, God, is there something that would just, you know, completely obliterate me and, you know, like reform me on the other side. And I think as we talk about tier two, as that kind of really core transformation, maybe that's what's attractive for, to people in it. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to acknowledge though, you know, that after, you know, this is non-linear that after your tier two experience, so as you've gone back and done a lot more tier one and, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, I, I'm not, in, I'm not in any hurry for tier two or three mm -hmm. and there's so much in tier one and it's so rich and it's, you know, it's so hard, <laughs> but it's so amazing. It's, there's a, there's so much to explore in there. And I, you know, I think my tier two is, you know, I like the idea that it's slowly shifting a little bit and that's good enough for me for now. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. um in the book, go ahead, Sash. No, no, please. Uh, in the book, uh, Stealing Fire, um, it's a book on psychedelics and um, in business. There's, there's, I rem there's a page in there and I'm remembering like one of the paragraphs it's talking about the obsession with transformation um, that all of biology has and that uh, even dolphins will seek out psychedelic drugs right they'll they'll um they'll poke at uh, I think it's like blowfish or something to get high and and so these like other species other than human are all fascinated with with the psychedelic like triggering that altered state of consciousness so the question is why why are we fascinated with it and one of the theories that stealing fire has that the book has is that it's because our biology is driven towards transformation just as much as it's driven towards food and that it's a it's a primary drive it's an evolutionary drive which is clear right i mean our system is driven to evolve so transformation is something that's very primal inside of us and so I'm just questioning whether or not that's an aspect of the motivation into understanding tier two more because there, there has there's this like mysterious transformational aspect to it that that maybe taps into our primal drives, our, prim our more primitive drives, no different than sex or like, you know, procreation and food, et cetera. Just a theory. Yeah. Daniel, anything cooking over in your corner there? <laughs> nothing on my side yeah. <laughs> yeah i think were you gonna say something Daniel? no no 
you know, in this Daniel did drop that you you dropped that bomb, I think. I think we you said it and then I was like, this is very um both it it's provocative in a way when when you said that uh like that just going back a little bit, but that that core that what we would normally call like um that core self in IFS in tier two itself might just be an exile. Right. right. So I, th I think that's a really profound thing to say that we kind of skipped over. But so if <laughs> you may be sitting with the impact of that. I don't know. <laughs> I think the reason I didn't go there because it created more confusion in my, uh -huh. in my brain because it's like, well, that's what I feel like I went through. Uh -huh. So then I got stuck in like, 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 it's like, okay, now I'm really confused on what's tier one versus tier two. But yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, how about we we move on? <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's see. Um, what does the panel uh, think about? Uh, this is from uh, Simaral. And uh, what does the panel think about combining supporting this work with meditation practices? Meditation could be quite a nice thing. I think it depends on the style and how intensely someone is using the meditation practice. That's usually my only concern. If I'm working with someone and they have a very intensive meditation practice that's been utilized as a very pervasive management strategy that becomes yeah. difficult to inhibit in the container. But if it's a optional um, management strategy or, or, or a resource, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it to, to support someone. Um, outside of, of the container. Yeah. I, th I think that distinction is a good one, right? So if, if somebody has to have equanimity, <laughs> that's not quite equanimity. <laughs> that's, that's like, you know, kind of really doing things to have a very particular outcome. Um, I think true equanimity is actually just tr truly flowing with everything that's coming up. And if something is you know takes you and takes you down this road and it's completely part of your um relative small self existence and reality and it's a it's a trauma memory it's like i think equanimity is saying okay let's go with it right not oh. let's let's stay centered so it i think it, yeah i think it does depend on the type of meditation and what what we're going for yeah eric I'd say, go ahead, John. Um, if there's it, what I've noticed is, depending on the dissociation, you can like I'm just repeating what Daniel said. If, if depending on the dissociation, if you're coming from a place of dissociation and you're meditating, it could just reinforce the dissociation. But once that dissociation gets cleared out and you choose the same meditation, it might not. It's might. It's not going to give you the same fix as it used to in terms of you know, reinforcing that dissociation. So you might notice the meditation having a whole other impact on your nervous system mm -hmm. and working on your behalf in a whole other way. So your organism is going to like reorganize to, to sense into the meditation and go, Oh, I know where this works now. I know how to use this tool, this meditation tool for good. If, if there's dissociation in the way, then your nervous system is going to look at the meditation going, I don't know what to do with this because I'm hitting up against dissociation. So all I know is to use it to manage the dissociation. It's, it's That's how I kind of see it. I love you naming that piece for sure. Yeah, it's really it's nice. My experience. Mm -hmm. It's almost like my mm -hmm. system was starting to shift from state four to state three. Um, I would say with my psychedelic work, with ayahuasca, but also with my meditation practice. And as it was shift to state three, I'm trying to reinforce my I'm trying to like manufacture state four with going to meditation retreats, meditating three to four hours a day, um, <laughs> more ayahuasca, and just so that I don't end up going into state three. Right. I think the people who are into spirituality, I'll just make that as a broad category that coming a little bit back to um, transformation you know and why that's so compelling 
but you know, we we hear stories, let's say of Eckhart Tolle, who, if you've heard his story, he was miserable and depressed, I think, something in that realm, and then had this transformation, and then, you know, then he was in a state of equanimity and, and, and bliss or whatever. And now he, if you ever listen to him, I'm not going to make judgments about it. I'm not going to go into it, but he he seems to, I, I think a lot of people are wanting that, you know, that I want to get to the state where I am equanimous all the time and nothing bothers me like Eckhart Tolle, you know, or Byron Katie or, you know, whoever the person they've read about, um, as opposed to what you, how you define it, Saj, which I love in, in, in in the peace at work, the equanimity, and, and really in life, I think, is whatever is coming here, I'm gonna be with it and be more of an animal in my body that is feeling the fullness of all of it and not something that's trying to be separate from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's Thank compelling. Yeah. It's compelling. I hear this a lot from, you know, people are suffering. Why wouldn't they want to just be, you know, so clear and peaceful all the time? It's why wouldn't you want that if you're if you're just miserable a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's I mean, right go ahead, Jay. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it right there. That's a draw to someone like Eckhart Tolle, right? That a way to alleviate suffering someone that um has that even kill stability equanimity non-reactive unbothered um no emotional disturbance there's there is a lack of there is a lack of suffering that signals i think if there's the possibility of experiencing less suffering while having access to um a wider range of emotional experiences or where emotional reactivity is okay and it could be met and it could be felt and it could also be like utilized to kind of move through relationships and through life uh, i think that will open up a different pathway mm -hmm. a different option at least yeah well it, it's the like again you know the what's the point of being incarnate if <laughs> if you're not going to be incarnate right there's uh like there we're here for something right um is it just to uh, uh, float above being here? Or is there something really delicious about being here, even though it's a roller coaster ride? Mm -hmm. Even though it sucks, like, you know, end of life sucks, but, but you know, th there's so many things about life that suck. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm still so glad that I'm here for it. This topic actually like speaks to my heart. Like I get tears thinking about this. Um, uh, and I, again, I can only speak from my own personal experience. Like maybe there's people out there that really do find that place and all to them. I wish I could have, because this way it's a bumpy road. So if that way worked for works for you, keep going. <laughs> but it never worked for me. And I tried it. I tried it left, right and center, upside down and backwards. Like, and constantly I could never do it and I just pointed the fingers back at me like there must be something wrong with me let me try harder let me try this there's something wrong there's something wrong with me wrong with me wrong with me and then it would just push me harder to try these other ways like Eckhart, like Eckhart was one of them that so many infinite number of ways to try and get to that place that everyone speaks about and it didn't work and it just reinforced that sense of insecurity inside of me, shame inside of me, just drive and push to, to get there. And like, like, I just wonder how many people are still are locked in that insane cycle. And it wasn't just me. Um, so I want to just name that. Uh, and the other thing is, I would never I, I now that I understand the juiciness and the aliveness and the orgasmic kind of feeling that emerges when you're in body, in animal body, I don't, it wouldn't matter what Eckhart would promise me. I would, I don't want it. Yeah. I do not want it. This is so much more juicy and tasty. This is so much more moral. Like, it's like I have like part of being in body is having a moral compass. 
right? And if I'm in bliss state, I don't really, like, it's like nothing, if I don't react to anything, you know, like, where's my moral compass? And so there's something so alive and juicy and healthy to being in my animal body that I will never want to give up. So one of, that's my soapbox around that. <laughs> and I am, my curiosity is people may not be going to some level of enlightenment for it, but they might be going to, if I follow this food plan, I'm going to be even keel. I'm going to be like, if I just exercise every day, follow this food plan, do this, do that, then I'm going to be even keel, non-reactive and be able to go through my days and work like a, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I'm wondering how many places, like how many outlets are people going to, to get to that Nirvana? and avoiding the deeper animal body and the pain and suffering and tragedy that's tragedy that's in the body. So mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. curious <laughs> on that. Yeah. For me, um, I'm, I'm big on choice. So like, I think, I think anyone kind of moving in that direction towards Nirvana, towards transcendence, I think that's all completely fine. Everyone gets to choose what they want to do with their life and, whatever they find to be the most fulfilling. Um, I just like, um, I guess, people to sense or at least have some experiences where there's other options available and then seeing if someone wants to move in that direction or not. Because yeah. I know for me, I have my own opinions around it because I wanted to move in this direction of more embodiment and relationship and intimacy. And I ended up moving towards spirituality since that was the only pathway that was available since relationships had too much terror lodged into them without me knowing it and so i think at the end of it like everyone makes their own choices it's more so just knowing that there is other options that that is not the only option for a fulfilling connected life it doesn't have to be just with the cosmos yeah I want, yeah how many of the people who are trying for the inner Bana and so on are just deep down terrified to trust another human to help them through the very intense difficult feelings that are stored up in their nervous system you know so yeah yeah if we if we can think about it as a solution right mm -hmm. so it's a solution to this to the suffering of life and uh and i think we on this call are suggesting oh well there's other solutions to the suffering of life which is you know it really gets the relationship <laughs> it gets it gets balanced out the suffering of life gets balanced out by the beauty of life and yeah and i also wonder those who have are seeking um the that refuge of nirvana and i'm and for those who get there like again i'm a little bit jealous like that's awesome kudos and at the same time, what sort of negative consequences does that state have to your children and your grandchildren and your neighbors? What are the consequences of seeking that and actually attaining that? Like, I am kind of curious about that. Mm -hmm. Does does it create a, will, is there, is there going to be a trauma that occurs to your children as you're actually reach this place? Because children, like children are innately animal bodies. Like they're all body, they're pure like bumbles or orgasmic kind of like playfulness, right? And so I am kind of curious the impact that might have on generations. Yeah, because you've kind of left. You've left. And so you're just, these children who are animal bodies are being dismissed, right? right? The animal body is being dismissed, it's being gagged. And so what does that do to our kids? Okay. All right. Um, are we ready to move on? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we're not a brief bunch here. <laughs> okay, uh, this is from Wes again. Uh, do you have Thanks collective? Much. Yeah, missed uh, Chrissy's question before. Oh, uh, what did I miss? The round integration. Yeah, it's a third one. Oh, did I? Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, Chrissy. Um, how does integration differ at each level? What is needed at each level to support integration? I think all three levels would benefit from community, mm -hmm. connection, 
to nature and uh, I'll just start with that. <laughs> yeah. I think relationship would help all three levels. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say it's even necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like what we were talking about earlier, just the amount of destabilization and intensity that shows up from tier one and tier two to the point where it gets difficult to discern them. Like, and then regardless of which tier it is, they're just going to, you're going to need that support like through that process. Yeah. yeah. Anything, Jaya, on that one? No? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, 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 hey, we were brief. I know. <laughs> we were brief. <laughs> like, what's that word? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So back to the other one. Uh, do you have collective or ancestral trauma showing up in the piece of process? I assume that due to staying so somatically and relationally focused, there is not much discernment about the source of the trauma that is stored. And uh, so, yeah, I think Wes, you're you're answering your own question here. Um, that that's how we approach it. We it really doesn't matter where things are coming from. The fact is that if it's manifesting, if it's a present moment here and now experience, it's in your system. And uh, you know, us assigning um, uh, causality doesn't change what has to happen with it. Yeah, um, it's a oftentimes I'll just say we will be working with the process and we have no idea where the charge is coming from. We're just completely working with a present moment process. We're dancing with it. We're in relationship with it. And it might not have any sort of secondary consciousness content, any labels around what it is, where it's from or anything like that. It really doesn't need to in this work, which is amazing, right? Which is like kind of, you know, if, if so much processing can be hap happen without any story, what does that mean for, uh, you know, most of Western psychology, which is all about story, which is all about secondary consciousness, understanding, connecting the dots, uh, orienting to, to the story. And yeah, but uh, I just want to acknowledge how challenging this can be, you know, for, at times that people find it so hard to surrender into what the body's trying to do if they don't know what the body's trying to do. Mm -hmm. That's normal that, you know, I, I just love that though, that there's that level of surrender that's necessary where the mind doesn't get to, <laughs> you know, be in control and and really be a part of um, figuring things out like it loves to do and so on. It 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 then becomes you know just such a bodily animal thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love that about it, and I you know I have my challenges with it too, but. but um, it's such a rich part of the piece of process for sure. Yeah. I, I want to just add the layer of culture and how our culture pathologizes body, which again, that type of programming can make it so much more confusing when we do have experiences, whether they're tier one, tier two, we like with that type of like, well, it comes back to like, you know, transcendence and, and Nevada, if, if we are gagging the body and, and interpreting the body as, as pathology and something that we have to somehow override or transcend, then we start, right. And we have a culture and, and it's happening all around us in various different forms. Um, it, that is, that's such a, a difficult thing to begin to actually not take on it's because it's a form of gaslighting and um, own one's experience deeply. So I just want to name that cultural piece that comes in that just makes it harder than it needs to be. I don't think it, I do question, would it be really this hard? Like, would it really be this destabilizing if we didn't have a culture that pathologized, pathologized our bodies and relationship? So, and, and in many ways, I think what we need to do is that lens of pathology that culture projects onto body is actually culture needs to reown that, 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 that projection right it is 
culture that's pathology that's pathology not us not our bodies so i do think that's a projection of culture right? that culture needs to reclaim here here yeah that's that's the west that what you're just describing there is the western mind yeah mm -hmm. secondary consciousness mm -hmm. rationality um and like being over uh nature in that way rather than being a part of it yeah mm -hmm. Um, okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. You know, uh, you're gonna. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to add one more thing oh. to that to that question. Um, you know, when I'm working with someone, I'm not. I'm open to the idea around things being like collective material or ancestral material, but I'm really just seeing if it's, um, if it's either deepening the process or taking someone away from the process. So, I think I've I've had situations where someone's in their process and then they start talking about the collective pain for all women as they're connecting it to their trauma and then at one point we'll inhibit that and it'll bring them deeper into their experience and their own personal grief with the material that we're working with mm -hmm. so if there is ancestral material that comes up in the process because there's times when people are sharing their their mental content and making connections if that is supporting the process if that's so if that's deepening the process i'll go ahead and move in that direction um, but then at times I've, I've seen it used as a way to yeah. step away from their own personal pain and suffering. Yeah. Which I, I feel like what you just said there, Daniel, could be said about identity, right? There's mm -hmm. ways in which identity and identifying with a group um, and can, can either like deepen the process or can, can be a way to, to manage the process to step out of it. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so we already touched on this one. Uh, I'll just read it. It's from Anne. How does parts work come into this model? I feel like we spent a chunk of time on that. Uh, John said, uh, can it be enough for some traumatized individuals uh, to work through tiers one and two, but not necessarily pursue tier three in a dedicated way, particularly if work at tier one and tier two has already afforded them glimpses of connection with transcend with the universal. Um, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know how you guys see it, but uh, I think tier three is totally optional <laughs> for, I mean, all of this is optional, right? But, but, uh, but again, it, I guess it depends on for what, I mean, if somebody is approaching it because they want to end the this you know suffering that they're having at this human realm experience um i don't necessarily think you have to have tier three experiences for that i'd be curious it's um the question's reminding me of dan siegel's work on his nine domains of integration i just actually just looked it up mm -hmm. um and he suggests that tier three although he doesn't use that word tier three but he calls it like transpirational right, which is this unity consciousness, is an emergence. It's an emergence. It emerges out of the, the tier one and tier two. Again, he doesn't use those words, but there's eight other domains that he says has to be integrated uh, in our, within our psyche. And when it does, there is this emergence of unity consciousness that occurs. So I would suggest that like I, I like his interpretation or his theory, and I think it fits here as one possible answer. Yeah, and you know, there's people who, like, there's, again, there's so much work to do in tier one alone, and yeah, so much um to so much to harvest from that so many benefits just from tier one alone you, you know if people don't ever want to go to tier three they're gonna have still so much benefit from tier one alone yeah mm -hmm. yeah um okay uh thank you moving on uh that's what this is from Jen. Uh, is it, excuse me, is it possible to recommend, uh, is it possible to recommend for folks who engage in PSI training and this work 
who presently self-identify as existing in tier one domain or at the level of self-progression according to this model. I'm not quite understanding the question. Well, too. Okay, I'll just, yeah. Is it possible or recommended for folks to engage in PSI training and this work who presently self-identify as existing in a tier one domain? Okay, I get that. Sorry, I, I misread something. Or at the level of self-progression according to his model. I don't get the second part, but um, but yeah, I would say this model is for people that are living in tier one work, right? That's um, that's what it's designed for. Are you Although I'm gonna add, if I'm, I don't know if I'm interpreting your question right, but I wanna say if the model is also for people who are living in tier three, because as you drop down into tier one and you start clearing that out, you're gonna have a way more profound experience of tier three, mm -hmm. unity consciousness. You're jipping yourself by not going to, into tier one and tier two. If you really wanna to get to that state of unity consciousness, again, and if we, if we suggest that Dan Siegel's uh, interpretation that unity consciousness is emergence, you have to do tier one and tier two to really build that tier three in a healthy way, in a moral way. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> okay, all right, Great. Um, okay, uh, this is from Sarah. I'm curious how you assess where someone is in their, in their tiers and do people move between them fluidly or once uh, say body is resolved, stabilized, is that more permanent? Maybe we can answer this one pretty briefly by saying in PSIP, we're just focused on piece tier one and mm -hmm. we're not trying to assess anything else. We're just trying to do tier one work. Yeah. PSIP. Pretty much most people out there have compromise at tier one. So that's where we're starting. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Ian writes, um, in my integration groups, I often meet people who had high dose tryptamine as their first therapy experience and are confused and do not feel helped by it. I see and personally know of therapists who administer these high doses and push back on me when I suggest starting with lower doses. Uh, how do you open the discussion when it implies that what they are doing and believe in may be doing harm? You send them to our panel discussion on love, light, and trauma. <laughs> uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, that the last story of that panel discussion mm -hmm. and and all of it is a really good answer. Yeah, there's so many stories that people have of going into high dose states, even if the container is uh, therapeutic. Um, you know, there's there's lots of things that we have in the piece of protocol that that talk about you know that are you know, assessing a person's capacities for going into some of these places and, you know, doing a Hail Mary, essentially, you're flying blind, right? You don't know the person, they're coming to you for this powerful experience and then just kind of taking them into it. And I, I think that there's ethical considerations around that. Yeah. I would also suggest that maybe more work in these cl clinics uh, needs to be done around their own countertransference. How much is that playing into choosing these higher doses? Like you use lower doses and it's more effective than they might, these clinicians might feel more challenged to hold that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a cultural piece that plays out too around like high dose, high doses if it's coming from like the ceremonial space, even though it's within a therapeutic like office um, or therapeutic like container. Um, the idea that whatever the medicine brings you is exactly what it needs to bring you and, and that you have to be with it, even if it's confusion. Like I could see something like that coming in those spaces and um, the idealization and the protection of the medicine and the experience around the medicine rather than thinking about other conditions that are necessary in order for someone to have um, a supportive 
and like helpful process through something like that. Um, and from the conversations I've had with people around it and my sense of that particular culture around psychedelics, it is quite, quite guarded, you know, the idea that the medicine should show the person like where they need to be and whatever it comes with, that's, that's yeah. exactly where they need to be at with the process, which then becomes a self-enclosed system. And you can't, <laughs> you can't really assess it or be critical or, or think about other options or possibilities that are leading to that situation or to that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, there's, there's so much in that scenario that we could talk about and, and then, and then, but the uh, the end of the question is is like a, one of skill, right? It's uh, how do you skillfully um, uh, talk to people who are doing really like practices that you know might not be that helpful in in uh, in the psychedelic world? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think having a good understanding of the three tiers and what they involve would be helpful in that discussion. Mm -hmm. if you were able to convey the three tiers and what they are trying to address and what they are not designed to address and that might be really helpful yeah you know i i think generally I, I feel like a lot of what we're describing here is saying that you know there's maps and models and understanding that we have that we can bring to the psychedelic session we can't you know, if you just have one sort of thing and it's this magical thinking idea that, okay, I'm just going to sort of let you go into this experience and then I'll be here when you come back out <laughs> or something, you know, and then, you know, you're, you're, it's such a, a broad, simple answer to a much, much more complex question. So I would always be, you know, suspicious about that. It's like, you know, does does our our human development all of a sudden not matter because we're in a psychedelic state? Does trauma all of a sudden not matter? Does our biology not matter? Does you know so many things about us that make us who we are? Do do we need to throw out everything we know about how that functions because we have this sense that oh well we're going into this kind of you know magical spiritual dimension of of existence? Um, so I guess I, I would just say I would be, um, uh, uh, if I was a client doing this, I would want to really know that my, the person who I'm working with, especially if I'm doing this because I know I have trauma, because I'm, I have depression and anxiety or PTSD and my relationships are suffering. If I'm coming to psychedelics because of that, I would really research what my practitioner is bringing to the table. You know, I, I wouldn't just assume things. Um, and I, I, yeah. oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, sorry. please go ahead. I, I just want to name the the tier three of that belief system you mentioned, Daniel, that the medicine is bringing you whatever you're meant to have. In other words, something greater than you is you, you got to give your full trust to that that is tier three as opposed to tier one, which is you, you, you need to trust your body and the person, your therapist. It's relational and somatic. Um, and that answer of you need to trust the medicine is not giving any room for tier one, obviously. There's no, there's no, um, it, no understanding of that, no place for that. So, that's a huge difference in what we're offering in PSIP is your your invitation is to put your trust in a in a different place. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. So let's see if we can go through the rest of these a little uh, with some brevity here, uh, just to you know see what we have to say about these. Um, Ivy has a question here, but it seems like she she it was contextual. Like you put this in here, Ivy, would you also say pre-personal core self, the essence uh, of primary consciousness as well? I, I feel like you were referring to something that was going on during the, um, the presentation that we can't reference uh, the, the context of that right now. Um, Jen said, uh, is it accurate to consider this model in a self-perpetuating feedback circular fashion? 
For example, in an ideal situation, an individual progresses up through the tiers one, two, three with accrued learnings and transcendence, then cycling back to inform our tier one presence and so forth in per perpetuity. I like the idea around that. I don't know how much of it applies. And I think some people exploring tier three work are hoping for a process like that where mm -hmm. the tier three revelations and and shifts and and insight could be integrated and inform uh, our tier one as well as our tier two existence. Um, right. Mm -hmm. I think often with the population that we work with, we we don't we don't see much of that happening. Yeah. If any, you know. Um. But it, and I, I think a, 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 an important word here is in perpetuity, right? An important idea. It seems like what Jen's describing is a circular movement where, you know, your the development that's happening at each of these is then you're taking back to the other stages with it. And I, I don't, I, I'll be curious if that's something that turns out to be the case, but, you know, it seems that when people are, you know, people can be mostly done with tier one. Um, I, I don't think that we have to keep coming back to tier one to, to continue doing healing work at that level. Yeah, I, I think it's finite. Hi there, you guys thoughts about that? I hope tier one is finite. <laughs> 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 Speaking personally. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. Well, Chrissy, uh, how does integration differ between th these three levels? Okay, we already touched on this. Um, it was an integration question. Um, John, uh, can it be enough for some traumatized individuals to work through tiers one and two, but not necessarily tier three in a dedicated way? particularly if work at tier one and tier two is already afforded them. Yeah, I, we, we touched that quite, that, that was a previous question that we already touched on. Uh, Samarol, uh, can this work be supported by, am I rereading? Yeah, I, you are. Okay, did I, do, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. No, 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 you're not rereading. I think those questions, there's, there's, there's two. two. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they re-entered um, the question. Oh, oh, got it, got it, okay. Uh, So the next one would be Jen, uh, around AD, AADP. Okay. Um, why don't you read it, Daniel, since you're looking at it? I'm going. Yeah. Jen, I would love to hear more about a PSI and AADP integrative approach to therapy. Yeah. That's the one that, that <laughs> Carrie should have been on the call for. <laughs> um, I, I have some thoughts about this, but but very briefly, I think I think what AEDP truly specializes in is what we would call relational solution in the PSI world. Uh, basically, um, you know, they're accompanying people in in the their aloneness, right? There's they're kind of having this really sort of fine tuned um, accompaniment. And, and so I think they're focused on that. And I think they're focused on sort of, you know, the like having transformance and very powerful corrective experiences and sort of what, what comes out of, you know, uh, solutions being, um, you know, when, when people really get that somebody is with them, uh, I think that's what AEDP specializes in. And when we we get AEP, AEDP uh, practitioners or students that have been doing that work, um, that solution side is, seems to be really well built out in their systems. Um, I think what PSIP would add to that formula is of course everything, the way that we are um, going into negative transference, the way that we bring up the nightmare in, in a person's system. Um, I think we, we have such fidelity with the nightmare and we, you know, juxtapose it right next to the solution piece. And so I, I feel like, um, you know, again, I'm not speaking for ADP here since I, I haven't done that work and, or trained in it. Um, but, you know, we're, 
what we're doing in this model is really taking sort of, you know, the, the really well-developed solutions and relational solutions and taking them to places where it never existed. Um, okay. And another thing that you could check out, Jen, there's a community-wide case consultation um, call that's on oh, the website yeah. around the YouTube with Saj and Carrie Glacier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you guys had like a mm -hmm. pretty good discussion around this this very question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great place. That's a great resource. Um, I just want to let everyone know I'll need to go in about two minutes. Okay. Yeah, well, what, I know we didn't finish everything here, folks, but we got a lot done. And uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, I think why don't, why don't we leave it here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time, your engagement. This is great. <laughs> we, <laughs> I think we spent half of it talking about Eric's question, <laughs> but it was a good one. And I think a lot of people will find value in that. Um, all right, folks, thanks a lot. And we'll, we'll see everybody at the next uh, community-wide event. Oh, good to see everyone. Okay, bye-bye.